Another year down, 2019, Year of the Gamers concluded. But perhaps if we're lucky, 2020 can be Decade of the Gamers. And with these upcoming titles I'll be talking about today, damn, there's a good chance of that. Let's go. Vampire The Masquerade Bloodlines is getting a follow-up this year, and with how much fun the original was, despite the unpolished misfit it came out as, a game like it, given the chance to reach its full potential, could be something very, very cool. Another epic gaming comeback. And who knows, one day this decade we may possibly, I know this might sound crazy, even get Metroid Prime 4. There seems to be a sudden deluge of epic comebacks happening at the moment. If your decade plus old cult classic isn't getting its follow up now, I don't know what to tell you. But no matter how many of these we get from this point forward, do any of them stand a chance of executing a long awaited return as perfectly as Devil May Cry 5 just did? There was 11 years between Devil May Cry 4 and 5. To put that into perspective, that's a longer gap than there was between Metal Gear Solid 1 and Metal Gear Solid 4. MGS4 being a game steeped in nostalgic imagery and reflection on the passage of time. Devil May Cry 5 picks up its story right where 4 left off, which by itself feels like a flex. When a follow-up takes as long as DMC5 to release, it's almost expected there will be some kind of large shift in premise, or a refresh or reboot to the IP from the ground up. DMC5 doesn't do that, yet it seems to be aware of its place as a long-awaited comeback. The game is drenched in the theme of legacy, it's even the name of the main theme tune. Dante finds the old Sparta home in ruins and tatters, but there discovers a power that allows him to make a comeback and be stronger than he's ever been. Holy shit. I can't believe this franchise is still standing. When Nero fully comprehends the story he's a part of is the moment he's able to go full Devil Trigger and be on equal footing with the brother's Sparta. I mean, what game manages to harness the powers of ancient times more than one where a protagonist can pull off a center parting in 2019? Devil May Cry 5 is great though because it knows how to maintain a balance between old and new, delivering payoff for fans without neglecting new ideas, bosses, and characters. It has remixes of old music, but also incredible new tracks that have become iconic in their own right. So there has to be a balance, you can't just cater to nostalgia the entire time. Exemplifying that, unlike the others, Virgil holds on to the past in a bad way, and it's up to the more recent protagonist, Nero, to stop Virgil and Dante from dwelling on the conflicts of the past. Now that DMC5 exists and has given us a perfect payoff to the old, while reminding us how great the new can be in such a spectacular fashion, every comeback from here on out is gonna have a hard time living up to it. Devil May Cry 5 was firing on all cylinders. Executive producer Jun Takeuchi told Itsuno to make the game scream quality just by looking at it, and that he wanted the game to be relevant for the present and not just rely on its past glory. And that comes across immediately by taking one look at the game. It can easily stand next to any other modern AAA game visually, despite being a franchise dormant in this form for 11 years. The game was given a lot of care and attention despite its absence. I dare to say it surpasses the look of other AAA games, upping the bar. Of course, I wouldn't care how good the game looked if it didn't also have the cathartic blast of choice-driven, fast-paced, freeform combat that it provides. But it elevates the game that little bit further, alongside the smaller details the title is jam-packed with that make it feel dense. Secret taunts, cutscenes that start differently depending on how you enter them, hidden endings and quick difficulty unlocks, the nuance the tiniest little move addition like Quadruple S adds to the entire combat system, the cheeky ways you can rebuff attacks, the amount of detailed, tiny animation work all over the place is just stunning. The fact that on top of that list of details the game looks cutting edge is what takes DMC5 to such high levels of quality. No corners cut because the series has been untested in a while. It's easy to see a world where Devil May Cry got the comeback it deserved but emerged as something with a budget look like Shenmue 3, where there wasn't enough time, money, or talent allocated to its production. Shenmue 3 is the kind of thing that will likely have small appeal outside of its existing fan base because it's unlikely to impress modern audiences at a glance, and perhaps not even older fans who don't want to play Shenmue if it doesn't represent the cutting edge like it once did.
I think there lies the pretty obvious key to bringing back a dormant IP, which had undeniably classic games or a game in its past. Give it the money and attention and care it needs to look cutting edge while keeping the core the fans loved about it. If you made God Hand 2, or God Hands as it needs to be called, and made it look this good, I feel like it would be a success. When you make a comeback but it doesn't go all out in making something that would be a hit without its heritage, you'll just find yourself in a bad situation again when only hardcore fans buy it. Once again, you'll end up wondering if this thing was worth bringing back at all if it's just to please a small crowd. DMC5 has this insane cutting edge look that I think delivers on creating a next level simulation of the kind of things the entire franchise was inspired by to begin with. It brings a whole new layer of detail to the demon aesthetic. The photorealistic demonic hellhole levels and mad transformations to me are like a 2019 realization of old taboo anime like Devilman or even Orotsuka Doji or something. It knows what it is and succeeded in its return by setting out to be the pinnacle of the aesthetic of the the gameplay and of the style that the franchise was a representative of over the years. A peak for its own ideas and the commonalities it shares with its inspirations. I'm getting a bit suspicious of cyberpunk, it's looking a little too cool to not be disappointing. I hope that isn't the case. Usually with these lists, I end up missing a lot of stuff that I do end up enjoying a lot. So perhaps it's good I'm not that excited for Last of Us 2. Maybe that means it will surprise me. I enjoyed Last of Us 1, but I was never desperate for a follow-up. With the huge success the first had right off the bat, I figured it would have been a good opportunity for Naughty Dog to make more original titles if they stood the chance of being that successful. I could be wrong, but I'm at present skeptical that this setting and these characters with this type of gameplay have too much more to explore in follow-ups that I'd be interested in, as opposed to the content other Naughty Dog IPs started out with. Naughty Dog games lend themselves well to YouTube analysis though, so at least there's that to look forward to. Naughty Dog's recent output is pretty, uh, experience-focused in that they're more about creating specific, exciting, memorable set pieces than super in-depth mechanical systems. So pretty much anyone can pick up a mic and write about whether those specific moments were effective to them, and hearing people recount their feelings on each one is pretty interesting. I'm sure when it finally comes out, YouTube is going to be jam-packed with video analysis. And something that has struck me about scripted YouTube video game analysis over the years is how much longer videos have gotten. There have always been outliers, but especially in the last few years, scripted analysis has reached an all-time high in terms of length. Even my own videos have dramatically increased in size on average compared to earlier work on the channel. Of course, I want to chalk that up partially to my video making process becoming more efficient, but I think there's more at play here for me and for others. Once you get more popular making videos and more people start watching your work, you end up getting more feedback. And I know part of my writing process and the writing process of many other game essayists goes as follows. Make a point, then write some fairly superfluous sentences afterwards in an attempt to clarify so as to preempt possible comments picking holes in the point, even if the point stands on its own already and the clarification feels self-evident. Now let me do exactly that by clarifying that that isn't necessarily a bad thing to do, but it does lead to unintended results like longer videos and situations where the quality of the writing itself can start to look impaired. In my PlayStation All-Stars video, I received comments saying I was repeating myself a lot, but that comes from a worry that people are going to misunderstand what I'm saying. And this is especially worrying if the subject at hand, I feel, might be slightly contentious. Here, if I don't remind viewers I'm talking about mechanics, characters, and features in terms of their inclusion in a slapstick fighter, this makes me worry a viewer may misunderstand something at some point and end up thinking I hate an idea in all contexts. This leads me to saying the words slapstick fighter a lot in this video. One of my most frustrating misunderstandings took place during my DMC vs. Revengeance video, in which I said it felt off that Raiden's split personality manifesting was catalyzed by professional chucklefuck Monsoon, who makes his first ever appearance here before causing such a large shift in a protagonist we'd known at that point for over a decade. I received messages telling me that Monsoon wasn't the only character to precipitate this change, but that also Sam was involved. 
and I don't really know what these people thought happened here. That I just fell asleep during the 30 minutes before this event where Sam taunts and messes with Raiden? The point I was making was that seeing Monsoon be the final nail in the coffin of Raiden's sanity was disappointing. It was disappointing that such an underdeveloped character was involved at all, to be honest. And even then, one of the major catalysts is this guy he's known for two seconds. I make mention that he isn't the only catalyst, but he's definitely the final one, and that rubbed me the wrong way. But without more clarifications added to the script, without mentioning I know the previous bit of the game happened explicitly, some people still get confused. And perhaps I'm giving too much thought to a few comments made by a minuscule sample of the thousands who watch one of my videos. But when I make a video, I want the content to be airtight. And sometimes I fantasize about being able to go back into already posted videos and add clarifications to arguments made. At the moment, YouTube doesn't offer functionality though to add segments to videos or to perhaps replace the file outright. So such fantasies are impossible right now. I suppose if YouTube did provide functionality to add clarifications to an already posted video, it wouldn't really matter in the long run though. Barring becoming a vampire, the awakening of some hidden demonic power, or some serious technological advancements, one day I'll be leaving this world. And when I do, there'll be no way to clarify anything I've said on YouTube or at all anywhere. Unless I delegated that task to somebody else, but secondhand clarifications may not be as accurate as I would have had them be. That said though, if I had immortality and used it to sit around and correct YouTube videos, I think that would probably be somewhat a waste of that gift. Which should probably bring into sharp focus how much time I should bother allocating such worries in my current, as of right now, presumed to be mortal life. Resident Evil 3 is getting a remake, and as someone who enjoyed the Resident Evil 2 remake, I presume that at the bare minimum, this game, working off the same formula, will make it an enjoyable time. That said, Resident Evil of all franchises getting more remakes has made me start thinking that remakes are missing an opportunity to be more than they are right now. The original three Resident Evil games featured different contradictory endings based on the campaign chosen at the start or decisions made throughout the game itself. Games taking place after previous titles that could be finished with different outcomes had to pick the optional events they thought were the best to follow on from. But why be tied to choosing those same events to follow up on when remaking a given game decades later? I'm not really a fan of remakes that just take the original game and slather it in what is, at the time of the remake, considered modern visuals. If I enjoyed the visuals in the original, then changing them, at best a lot of the time, is just a side grade, and at worst, can be a downgrade if the art style has been weakened somehow. Usually I like remakes that do their own thing and use the original's premise for a brand new experience. They feel like less of an attempt to invalidate the original title and more like a cool original game in their own right, or maybe a remix of what came before. Ratchet and Clank may be my most disliked remake, but its approach to not be the exact same game as the original barring graphics is one I generally like. It's just that in this case, Everything new that it did wasn't at all to my liking. So in the spirit of providing something new with the gameplay, why not take the plot or the premise or the setting in a different direction? Albeit a different direction that is good, of course. Especially in a franchise like Resident Evil, where different outcomes already exist to follow on from instead. You could use a remake to explore alternate outcomes to previous games. What if a key character did die in a previous title? Or an event the original follow-up considered canon didn't happen? How would the series change to reflect that? Once Resi 3 has been done being remade, Capcom will probably be unable to stop themselves from remaking 4. But I think with that, they're gonna face much more difficulty than with 2 and 3. There are gamers out there that just don't want to play a classic horror game with static cameras and tank controls. A lot of them may have a bias and not realize how much fun they could potentially be having. But it's fair to say that unfortunately, there is a contingent who find it hard to get to grips with that style. While a much larger swath of players can pick up and play a third person shooter with ease. What I'm trying to say is that unlike the old Resident Evils, Resi 4 has close to universal appeal. 
It's not just considered a great game, but one of those top 10 greatest ever games in a lot of circles. When it comes to critical appraisal, a remake stands to lose a lot by recreating those events and missing the mark. Even a great game may be considered a disappointment next to a title so many consider one of the best ever compared to games that I love, but the general public are relatively more split on now. Making Resident Evil 3 a third-person shooter gives us two quite different gameplay takes on the same premise, but how much is it worth making a third-person shooter a slightly more graphically intense third-person shooter, even if they do alter the level design like with the first three remakes. If anything, it would make more sense to remake Resi 4 in the fixed camera style if giving us a brand new take on its events was really the goal. But I feel like that's unlikely. If they remake 4, we'll probably still be getting a third-person shooter. So if in the case of Resi 4, the core gameplay and style must remain relatively similar, why not change the premise slightly? That takes us back to my original idea. A remake of Resi 4, or even Code Veronica for that matter, could lead on from different outcomes in the original three Resis, and present us with a new setting or premise, a new timeline. We could have the original timeline and a quote-unquote remake timeline that branches off and goes its own way. A series having different sequels follow on from alternate endings isn't even a totally new thing. A Resident Evil 4 remake could sidestep the issue of being compared as much to the beloved Goliath that is the original by focusing on a different premise. They could even return to some of Resident Evil 4's abandoned premises and ideas. Originally, 4 was going to involve the elusive Spencer villain and the progenitor virus, which ended up being plot points in Resi 5 instead. But what if a Resi 4 in an alternate timeline had us finally see this cancelled take? Maybe we could get something akin to the Hookman demo, or 3.5. That demo looked like it would struggle to run on a PS3, let alone a GameCube. I'm quite an outspoken fan of Resi 6, but I'm not blind to that game's mixed reception amongst fans. So it strikes me as unlikely that Capcom would want to remake such a large game that divided so many and keep it similar to the original, even if the original did sell so well. So perhaps this could be sidestepped too. By the time we get to a six game on this theoretical remake timeline, we could get an entirely different Resident Evil 6 with new premise, setting, and gameplay. One might say this could get confusing, having games named the same thing with drastically different premises, but we already live in that world. Countless games come back years later with different plots or as entirely different games, using the same name as an old title. And if two drastically different games named Resident Evil 4 is too complicated, then a subtitle should suffice in fixing that. The Resident Evil 3 remake is already distinguishing itself by dropping the subtitle the original already had. I see the attitude some gamers have towards remakes getting in the way of this idea, though. Some gamers view remakes as replacements for the originals, which is a shame because who knows what kind of fun they could be missing out on, especially when the difference in gameplay can be so vast between an original and a remake. I'm not talking about very obscure cases where a given individual truly can't access an original first. I'm talking about people who genuinely just want to tick a perceived experience off their backlog and view a remake as the best opportunity to access it with a presumed higher quality, though sometimes also regardless of the quality. So if you changed a premise drastically in a remake, you'd be drawing a thicker line in the sand, saying that the two are really distinct works. And I can actually see pushback to this happening when the finite nature of the human experience has people out there wanting to cut down on the amount of games they consume to just one title slash take per premise only. But I think the idea you've crossed a game off your list because you've played a remake is flawed, since remakes, no matter how similar, are always distinct works from the original. No matter how small the differences are, even if all that has changed are the graphics, you've always experienced one or the other. And for people who don't want remakes to produce alternate timelines because they're married to previous lore and creating one congruent stream no matter what in their minds, well, I'm sorry to break it to you, but again, remakes like RE2 already kind of are alternate timelines when events happen in them that didn't in the original. So in my mind, if remakes are distinct works, then they might as well at least sometimes capitalize on the further opportunities that can offer and create some totally cool and distinct alternate works that expand the universe by presenting us with alternate takes and possibilities that maybe at one point were on the table. 
Okay, you got me. That's what this entire prattle boils down to. I want to play Hookman Resi 4. It looked too good. Near Automata. Yoko Taro and Platinum teaming up? Who knows how crazy this game may end up being, gamers. Platinum with its action chops and crazy mask man working together? Diggity damn, I don't know what to expect. I've already started drawing fan art of this mysterious and bodacious female protagonist before release, so when this game comes out, it has to be good. Anyway, that's my list. Peace. A series having different endings. No, no, not. S A series, not, not. Hey Siri. A series having different sequels follow on from alternate endings isn't even a totally new thing. Thank you, Siri.